All right, we're continuing the Mr. Sheshaim, the week of Nikius, second part of um, the things to work on, specifically the sins that are the most common. And now it's going to discuss forbidden relations. Um, again, the whole thing is not here to make us depressed, but is to make us aware of all the tiny things that come into our everyday life that we realize uh, we don't necessarily pay attention to and we are prone to fail um, because it's so my, m minute. So it's a whole lifetime of awareness, but eventually we will get there one little minute thing at a time. So we shall now discuss the sin of forbidden relations. This is also among the sins which people crave the most and rank second to theft. As we find in the dictum of our sages mentioned above, most people fall into the sin of theft. A minority falls into forbidden relations. Although it's a minority, I think if the Ramcha was aware, uh, the Chazal was here today, they will say, uh, you know, it's not a minority. But I guess minority compared to theft. Um, now, one, wish, one who wishes to be untarnished by this sin will have also to exert no small effort. For the prohibition includes not only the forbidden act itself, but whatever approaches it in character as well. Indeed, it is explicitly stated in the scripture, you shall not practice intimacy that can lead to forbidden, forbidden relations, like what we call Yehud. Um, so, and our rabbis, may they may be blessed, said, the Holy One, blessed be He, Sorry, the Holy One basically say, do not say, um, since I am forbidden to have intercourse with a woman, I will hold her and be guiltless. I will embrace her and be guiltless. Or I will kiss her and be gui guiltless. The Holy One, blessed be He, say, just as a Nazar, Nazar, Nazir who vows not to drink wine is forbidden to eat moist or dried grapes or any grape liquor, or anything derived from the grapevine, so too are you forbidden to touch in any manner a woman who is not your wife. Anyone who touches a wo woman other than his wife brings death upon himself, and so on. So, obviously there are exceptions, but the key is to be careful. So that's where Shomer Nigia comes from, and where... Uh, we have to understand that because since it's the mo one of the most powerful desire, unless there's some barriers to that, we're, we're going to fall. It's, it will prone to fall. And we look at our society and we see the consequences. Um, notice how wondrous are the words of this, of, his dis of this dictum. For it likens this prohibition to the case of a Nazir, where even though the primary prohibition is limited to the drinking of wine, the Torah forbids him anything bearing any connection to wine. This was a lesson by which the Torah taught the sages how they should erect a fence around the Torah regarding the authority granted um, around the Torah regarding the authority granted them to add protective measures to its prohibitions. For they would learn from the laws of the Nazir to forbid because of a, pay, of a basic prohibition, anything that is similar in nature. So, yeah, something in nature is the same on Shabbat, we have the same thing, something that resembles the Melacha. Um, we are meant to live on a higher level than non-Jews because we are supposed to be role models for an ethical and moral society. And therefore, we have to be even more careful um, when we do things and put more fences. Thus the Torah did with, with respect to the mitzvah of the Nazir that it authorized the sages to do with respect to all other mitzvot. So we apply this to the other. Now, um, by, by this the Torah intended to teach that this is God's will. And that when he issues a prohibition, we should deduce what was left unstated from what was stated and forbid anything resembling it. Uh, so obviously it's going to show the other areas. Applying this principle in the area of forbidden relations, the sages 
prohibited anything akin to unchastity and similar to it, whatever body sense or part is involved. That is, whether it entails an act such as touching, embracing, kissing, and the like, or looking and gazing, um, speech, hearing, or even thought. So we are just speaking to a woman because you enjoy uh, just speaking and being in her presence. Already that's a problem. Um, so obviously we're not talking in terms of rela uh, having a conversation about something. But if the only purpose for me uh, looking at her or speaking to her or listening to her voice or anything like that, like Kalisha, all that is uh, all... Um, it's because I enjoy it, so then it's not good. Um, it's a type of unfaithful um, connection with someone else. If it's professional, it's different. I will now bring you proofs regarding all of these from the words of the sages. May the memory be blessed. So, regarding Chibuk Benishuk. Um, touching and embracing. You have already heard the statement I cited earlier. Regarding gaze, so this we know. Regarding gazing, the sages said, hand to hand, evil will not be cleansed. Whoever counts out money from his hand to the hand of a woman in order to gaze at her will not be untouched by the punishment of Gehinom. That's why by the Hasidim, they're very careful not even to put money in the woman's hand because... If, if, since they're so sensitive to never look at women, even just looking at her hand could be a rise a, or touching by mistake, could be a arousing, and therefore they put it on the uh, on the table and they take it they not not straight from hand to hand. So um, they're machmir with that. They all they also said. Rab said, why did scripture enumerate ornaments that are worn internally together with those that are worn externally? So let's see what he speaks about. Yeah, I'm trying to see what ornaments we... No, I think it's... That has to do with in the Besta Migdash. Um, not sure. Let's see what he explains. To teach you that even if one gazes only at a woman's little finger, it is as if he looked at her in indecent part. Um, so we know that we can. It doesn't matter what part of the body you focus on, even the finger, because you're starting to crave at something that gives you desire and ends up to be like any other part of the way, it, it ends up to be the same um, purpose and the, you end up to be, do the same sin at the end. Um, they also, so you don't start even with a little pinky because that is going to lead to um, much deeper. So that's, by the way, um, one of the reasons, well, actually no, I'm not going to put that here. They also said, why did the Israeli Israelites of that generation need atonement because their eyes fed on lunes. Um, then it says when Shabbos, they also said you shall keep yourself from every evil thing. That generation, uh, I was thinking, the generation, I think the generation of the flood, if I remember correctly. But it says also about when they were with Bilam. Anyways, I wasn't sure which one is uh, speaking about. Um, a person, they also said, you shall keep yourself from evil, every evil thing. A person should not gaze at a beautiful woman, even if she's unmarried, or at a married woman, even if she's ugly. As for talking to a woman, it was explicitly taught whoever engages in extended conversation with a woman brings evil upon himself. Regarding hearing, they said hearing a woman's voice is an indecency. Furthermore, regarding verbal licentiousness, namely in indecent speech, our sages already shouted passionately, and let him see no unclean thing in you. Unclean speech, namely obscenities. And they say because of the sin of obscene speech, new, like not refined speech, speaking about sexual stuff and all that, 
uh, not clean, new, tr new troubles arise and the young men of the enemies of Israel die. The young men of the enemies of Israel die. Uh, they also said, if one utters obscenities, Gehinom is deepened for him. Moreover, they said, everyone knows to what end a bride enters the bridal chamber. But if anyone sullies his mouth and speaks of it, even a, a decree of 70 good years is turned to calamity. So we have to be very careful speaking about anything sexual um, in our mouth. It should not, we should not be speaking dirty, so to speak. Um, because everything is going to lead, whatever you speak, you think, and therefore it's going to lead to action. Um, choo -choo -choo. They also say, that even the frivolous conversation between a man and his wife is related to him at the time of judgment. Be careful how you speak between, with, when two people are married, also try, you have to speak with refinement. You're king and a queen, you're not, uh, you know, you're not uh, teenagers. <laughs> with regard to listening to obscenities, they also said, even one who listens and remains silent is able, is liable, as it says, the wayward mouth is a deep pit. He who incurs the Lord's wrath falls into it. So just listening, stay away. It is apparent that all one's faculties must be innocent of unchastity and anything related to it. Someone may whisper to you, that what the sages said of lewd talk was merely a threat to keep one far from sin and applies only to the hot-blooded um, who are aroused to lust whenever they speak of it. But for someone who speaks of it in jest, it is insignificant and of no concern. Uh, you, your restored should be... No, that's not, that's not what it is. It's, it's even for simple people like... I mean, pure people like you. Um, the evil Yetzer Hara has just spoken. So that's, you know, that applies for like people who are really lasting. Or like, no, no, no. That's the Yetzer Hara speak like that. For the sages, may their memory be, of, uh, be blessed, brought this explicit verse as their proof. Therefore, the Lord in Shabbos, therefore the Lord shall no, have no joy in their young men, neither shall he have mercy on their orphans and widows. For everyone is a hypocrite and slanderer, and every mouth speaks obscenity. So that's in uh, Yeshaya, quoted in Shabbos. Note that this verse does not mention idolatry, uncha unchaste relationships, or murder, but rather hypocrisy, slander, and obscenities. These are all forms of speech without accompanying action. And because of these sins, there, were forth, there went forth the decree. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall he have mercy on their orphans and widows, for everyone is a hypocrite and slanderer, and every mouth speaks obscenity. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is still outstretched. So we see that uh, don't need to do any act, just speaking and being a hypocrite, saying one thing and not thinking it, all, all that stuff. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, we, ha we have to learn to be clear, transparent, honest with ourselves. Why do I like, why do I like, to, why do I speak to that person? Why do I like to speak to that person? What's my intention in speaking to that person? What's my intention of listening? All, all that needs to be thought in our mind. Uh, because otherwise we're doomed. Furthermore, if this is not true, how then are we to understand the impurity of lips mentioned by Yeshayahu? Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of, the, of a people of unclean lips. Rather, the truth is as our rabbis, may their memory be blessed, have said that lascivious talk is in fact lewdness of speech. Um, so meaning lascivious so lascivious is things that, that, that is not directly dirty so to speak but, but brings hints hints of things uh, so you might think okay you're not 
punished for that or it's not it's not that bad. Such talk comes under the same rubric as hollow tree. <laughs> Say no, because it's like you're it's actually aroused the Yetzirah to sin. So you're putting yourself in a situation just by hinting stuff like that. You're it's a type of hollow tree. Um such talk comes under the same summary of how tree forbidden like all other forms of unchastity um, other than the act of illicit relations itself. That although these forms are not subject to the punishment of excision, caress, um, uh, or judicial execution, they are nonetheless forbidden in themselves. This is aside from the fact that they lead to and bring about the principally proscribed act itself as in the case of the Nazir mentioned in the Midrash referred to above. And now we finish with thought. As for thought, our sages have already said at the beginning of our Braisa, you shall keep yourself from every evil thing. One should not entertain impure thoughts during the day, so as not to come to impurity at night. They also said sinful thoughts are more injurious than the sin itself. Because it stays in your brain, it's like a cancer of the brain. It's, it, it, it keeps you busy and distract you from everything, and and so it's it's it, it destroys you, like because you keep it in your brain, and you're fighting, and then you keep it. If you have a, if you sin, it's a sin. And you did it, and it's done. But the thought, it's just like it stays there, and then you, so you don't, you have, you can't allow it to enter into your brain. Just I'm just thinking of it. No, no, no. This it stays and destroys you little by little. It's like a slow death instead of a quick death. And scripture explicitly states, evil thoughts are an abhorrent to the Lord. We, um, we have discussed thus far two grave root sin over, those, over whose branches people are prone to stumble because of the abundance and the mind's inclination to rationalize them in one's desire to commit them. So this is for the sin of um, that, like immorality, immoral sins, forbidden relation, sexual sins, improper thoughts. So we see that it, it is intense, and I think almost every man who read that says, "Oh boy, I'm I'm in trouble." We're all in trouble, and that's okay because the key is to be working at it and to be thinking of it and to fight. As long as you fight the fight, you're good. You're a hero, you're doing, even if you sin all the time, but you fight, keep fighting, meaning you don't sin all the time. Like you, if, if you let yourself, oh, I see, I did it, I just do it, oh, who cares? Um, no, that's not fighting. Fighting is like you constantly fight, you try to fight, fight, fight. Okay, you fall, it's okay. I, I'm gonna make it happen. I'm gonna become more pure. There's not one man in the world that doesn't, is not challenged by that. Yosef at Sadiq was challenged so many times and even about him he said he lost some drops when he was with Potiphar and he needed help from his father. Hashem saving him. He, he brought his father and last moment he was able to, to, to save himself. And and, um, and we know in the Gemara Rabbi Akiva was running after a woman like even the great sages and the more the greater you say, the greater you are, the greater you yet are. So we know also it's a sign of greatness. So don't be demoralized, don't feel sad, don't feel depressed, don't give up, don't uh, don't think you're gonna go to Gehinom just like that. It's that's what the Yetzara wants you because Yetzara wants you to feel depressed about it and that you have no chance for you. Then you're gonna do even more and you give up the fight and that's it. Then he has you completely. So don't let him win. Be strong. Fight the fight. Be holy, pure, and God willing, uh, we'll celebrate the many battles won um, in Olamaba together.